straight into talking to John Chambers. So let's move over here. John, come on stage with me. Um, Good to see you. Thank you, John. Those of you who were here last year will remember John's spectacular energy. Uh, I don't know if he's going to run out into the audience this year. It depends but on the if question. He does, if he does, I would welcome it. Uh, All right. And uh, honestly, John is a, an icon and, and somebody who, who has been an advisor to Techonomy and, and to me, and I think a role model for business and for society in terms of how big he thinks, and obviously the scale of his success when he was running Cisco for so many years. Um, but John, I wanted to start by asking, you know, for the last few years, you've been talking about several things, and, and particularly France and India as models for how a nation ought to think about the state of the economy and the world we're moving into, and also the critical role of startups. So, what, and you've also published a great book. Um, wait, what's the title again? Connecting the Dots. Connecting the Dots. It made a tremendous impression on you. It, with the, <laughs> the book did, the title I forgot, I'm sorry. Um, I'm having fun with you, David. <laughs> uh, book titles yeah. are challenging. No, I'm teasing you, it so, is no, no, every, every, I, I it, respect we always, authors now more than ever, much harder than you ever dreamed well, to write a book. Well, congrats on that, because yeah, it you. isn't easy. And, uh, and we'll get to the book uh, uh -huh. specifically in a minute. But, what, is, what are you thinking about now? What is your main focus now? Well, you know, I always believe that whenever you start off a discussion, you want to go back to what did you say the year before and how accurate was it or not. Uh, four years ago, uh, you know, I felt that India would be the next big thing. And uh, candidly, it was based upon uh, leadership, Prime Minister Modi coming into his role, and a vision and strategy for the country. And at that time, we said it would outpace China in terms of its ex economic growth and become the top, not emerging market in the world, but moving much faster to develop country than others thought. And that happened. Uh, you know, when their economy is currently growing at about 8%, uh, I think it is very possible they grow at 10%. Uh, they are outpacing the rest of the world. That means the per capita income, if they do it right in terms of both inclusion of geography and gender capability, doubles every seven years. Uh, and Modi's made tremendous progress on it, both on ease of doing business and going from like 142 in the world to 77 this last With year. ease alone. of doing business? Ease yeah. of doing business. He's knocking down the barriers, and his courage has been unbelievable, demonetization and goods and sales, uh, services tax. So he's made the tough decisions, and I think he's a role model for other parts of the world, and he's seeing the economic benefits uh, of that. And he took the risks that were needed. India was not known for a lack of regulation. Right? No, they were not, and you know, they were absolutely a slow follower. And uh, I bet on India too early, 15 years ago, with uh, Second World Headquarters there. Great for talent, by the way, with engineers. Their IIT organizations are amazing. But you didn't see quite the, uh, the government alignment with business to be able to get the economic growth going where it is. He, he's done an amazing job. France, that we talked about last year, that was a, that was a, uh, a risky uh, projection, but it wasn't a projection based upon uh, just a gut feel. Uh, you saw the young people in France changing, and when people said, John, come over and see this, I said, no, I'll come over and bring my wife and you have a romantic weekend or go out to dinner with you, but that's the last place in the world you want to invest. And as anybody that's been following it knows, in the last three years, they've moved from the slowest startup engine in Europe, pretty flat at about 130 companies, venture capital back per year to 743 this last year. So they're crushing it. Macron, in my opinion, is the best leader in Europe. And he's making the tough decisions like Modi did and catching periodic uh, political heat because of tough decisions. But I think he's really the example for Europe and for the world. Then two years ago, we started talking about startups and the engine for the US economic growth. And, inclusion, and so doing 16 startups for me is fun. To answer your, oh, it is fun. It, it's like having grandkids. They well, just think, think if smart. everyone in this room did 16 startups, we'd really create a lot of jobs, right? Well, that's what we got to do. But it's like having grandkids. You get to give them advice. They think you're smart. I'm strategic partners with them. I'm not a VC, and that uh, tends to the world. Probably talk to them four to five times a week on average, wow. and uh, it is just so exciting. Uh, giving them advice, and for those of you who have been CEOs, it's also nice on Friday night, I give them the advice, and then I go have a bourbon and ginger ale and let them worry about it over the weekend. <laughs> yeah, it's a different environment there. But most recently, uh, uh, as you talk about creating an inclusive startup economy in France and an inclusive startup 
uh, economy in India. As we said last year, we're the only, only country in the world without a digitization plan nationally and a startup plan. And so trying to make a small inroads on that, I've deliberately spread the majority of my investments across multiple states. And this weekend, uh, I uh, was honored to uh, focus with West Virginia University on a vision of changing the state. And our state, uh, it's my home state, used to be the chemical center of the world, uh, the coal center of the world, more millionaires in, in West Virginia than all the United Kingdom. Our capital had 78,000 people, today it only has 52,000 people. And the only core thing you can do is have to go where the future is. And it's not the chemical industry is never going to return. Uh, Manufacturing is not going to return in the format. Coal mining actually might mine more coal but with less, less uh, employees. Is It's going to be a startup world. So we outlined a vision for the state uh, in conjunction with the governor and uh, the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate and both national senators, uh, Joe Manchin, the Democrat, and Shelley Moore, the Republican, but mainly it's Gordon Gee, who's the president of the university, who's been at Brown and Vanderbilt and uh, Ohio State, and uh, this is his last hurrah. He really wants to change the state, and I'm going to be his wingman on how to do that, and we're going across knocking down the silos in the school and getting the med school to work with the engineering, with the business school. Wow, putting the dean of, there you go. Yeah, amazing, go figure. And then putting the uh, head of the dean of the business school in responsible for startups across the whole university and say, how do you rechange that, bring in venture capital, et cetera. So you know me, uh, it's a very uh, innovative playbook, we hope. Uh, that will be across multiple segments of it. And if West Virginia can be the model for the rest of the nation, much like France was for Europe and India was for Asia, that would be pretty exciting. And maybe we can get job creation, uh, gender inclusion, geographic inclusion back to the heartland of America and the Southeast. So the formula, though, is in order to encourage startups and to help the state, you're going to essentially first reform the university, in effect and have it be much more collaborative, multidisciplinary, with the idea that that directly ties to the potentiality of startups in the region? Yeah, it's a pretty good summary. Uh, to that, I would add much more technology-oriented. Everybody talks about STEM. To me, you ought to teach technology, and you ought to teach artificial intelligence and uh, entrepreneurship. And those are the three cornerstones, I think, for the future. And so you're going to see us focus on artificial intelligence, cybersecurity. You're going to focus about collaboration across of it. And how does technology impact every single job in the future, as we all know, is going to occur? And we also have to be realistic. Technology is going to destroy 20 to 40 percent of the jobs that exist today. So if we don't get a startup engine going at a whole different pace, we're going to have a digital divide that makes today look small. And so, what's, so you think of what you're doing in West Virginia as something of a template for what could happen in the United States more broadly? Exactly, and, and David, you know, I have a lot of weaknesses, and we can cover that another time, but <laughs> <laughs> and my wife could list them forever. But uh, you know, the reason we did 180 acquisitions at Cisco is we had a replicatable playbook that moved with tremendous speed. Uh, we hit probably two out of three, hit or exceeded what we told our board we'd do. We did 10 of them for over a billion dollars. We could get a call on Thursday night from the NASDAQ and say, John, you're an idiot. There's a company that you should know that's going to be bought by your competitors. This is public knowledge, and you aren't even in there. And I was embarrassed, and I turned out. I said, what's the name of the company? I didn't know the company. I called my business development guy. He didn't know it either. Good news. We met with him the next morning. He called me in an hour and a half, said, John, get over here. By lunch, I had a handshake for a $3.2 billion acquisition announced on Monday morning. Tremendous success for us. But that's all about an innovation playbook. And that's really... Because you had the template to do it exactly. already in place. Right? And so it's like a sports team. Everybody knows what role they play, et cetera, whether it's in acquisitions, digitization. Hopefully in the startups, I have a similar template that we follow. And on uh, states, becoming startup states, we're going to see if we develop a similar uh, template. And you've got to realize if you keep running the same place and expect a different result, that's insanity. Uh, so if you're going to do it, you have to do it more of a, using my words, an architectural, uh, more complex, saying how do these pieces come together, whether it's breaking down the silos in the university, using your word collaboration, but more important, enforcing how the, you lay technology across it and how you begin to generate a number of startups, and then how do you, you create your early examples and put them up on a pedestal and still realize most of them will fail. One of the other themes of the whole event is this idea of how business and government can work together. I, I think I forgot to mention that just now, but yes. um, that is 
part of this, but you didn't mention like local big business or to the degree there is. I mean, is that going to work in West Virginia? And is that what we really need to do as part of the template? You've asked a, a series of questions, if I break them down in, in sequence. Uh, for me, uh, and I don't think I'm gonna be wrong on this one, this I think will be one of the easier forecasts for the future, is large companies in total across the US, across Europe, across Asia, will probably not add headcount over the next decade. Uh, I think artificial intelligence, uh, automation everywhere, digitization is going to completely destroy business models. 40% of them won't exist in a decade. But even those companies, if you're not growing faster than 10% a year, by the time you build in the capabilities of productivity increases and returning something to your shareholders and something to your employees, it means you're not going to add headcount. So I think in total, the big companies will probably not add headcount. So it's a zero-sum game. You might get one to move from Ohio to West Virginia or from uh, New York to Silicon Valley. Uh, I think all the job creation will come out of the smaller companies and the startups. That's why you've got to get this engine going at a much faster pace than we are today. We're failing America right now, and we're falling behind very fast. To the third element of your question indirectly, um, most innovation, in my opinion, will come from the startups. Now, some people will say that's been true for the last couple of decades. Respectfully, I disagree. Uh, I think it's been pretty evenly divided. The large companies could attract the best and the brightest out of a Stanford or MIT or other great schools, or from individual state schools, they'd take the top 5% and do well. Uh, today, when you go to these schools, it doesn't matter if it's Stanford or MIT or Polytechnic in France or the IIT universities, uh, in India, all of which I've been to in the last two months, and you ask the students, do you want to go to work for the government, or do you want to go work for the large companies, or do you want to go work for startups, 80 to 90% of the room raises their, their hand on the startups. Mm. And I was just at a Young Turk session in uh, India last week, and you see the best and brightest going there. Now, the implications for business is huge here, because if you believe that a large part of the creativity is going to go wherever the best and brightest go, they're going to go to startups, all of a sudden, the big companies to be innovative, and the CEOs, I think, instinctively get this, most of them, they're going to have to work with startups in a way they've never done before, even though they instinctively know the majority of startups will fail. We had a session yesterday with GE and J&J &J talking about how they are working so hard on that and getting some great successes. They really are, but uh, just like doing acquisitions, partnering with a startup is going to have to be a playbook both ways. The big companies either overlove you or they underlove you, or they have politics that silo you, et cetera, and you can just absorb a huge amount of the resource of the startup without getting any revenue or the breakaway. So how do you align and how do the big companies learn, learn to work with startups more effectively? And how do the startups have a playbook for how they work with the big companies more effectively? That's gonna be an art, and it's, it's something that, that I think will be interesting to see who masters that from the big companies and from the startups. It's interesting because when we talk about how government and business need to work together in the United States, uh -huh. I, I know even I and I think many others, tend, the mental model tends to be big companies. But you're actually saying we need a different mental model, that the way business and government need to work together is at a startup level more. I mean, and, and exactly, that's sort of to create startups, but also for startups' energy to come back into government, for the universities to have these closer ties. I mean, it's, it's a little bit of a pretty significant mind shift, I'd say. I think it's a huge mind shift. Uh, first of all, I used to believe, and you and I have discussed this over the last couple of decades, uh, that I used to think business working with government was a waste of time, and the last thing you wanted to do is to get too close to government. I was playing wrong, because with the speed of the internet air, and Clinton clearly uh, uh, echoed that in there, and he generated, and I was on stage with him at the White House when we announced the internet air. I was scared to death, David. Uh, <laughs> but I was the spokesperson because I understood the internet would change the way your world works, lives, learns, and plays, and we weren't a router company, and he grasped the implications of it. He understood what it meant for job creation, GDP growth, inclusive household income, and we all saw the numbers, 22 and a half million jobs uh, created in eight years, 34% uh, growth in the economy, 24% growth in the average American household income. 
And so the ability of government to grasp that, and the same thing's going to occur in digitization, except it's going to move faster and the breakage could be much worse, uh, uh, is going to occur. Government and business must work together. But I think traditionally, and I head up the U.S.-India Strategic Partnership Forum, which was large companies in America talking to large companies in India, advising Prime Minister Modi and the American government on how to work closer together. But we've recently started to add a lot of startups to that because I think the startups are the engine for where this is going to occur. And again, you know, a little bit critical of our own government here, we, we have a bunch of transactions in how do we make business easier to do in the U.S. and tremendous accolades to the government for getting tax policy finally after 20 years of lobbying for it corrected and repatriation occurring. But the focus needs to be more on the startups. That's where the creativity, job creation is going to occur. And 75% plus of the headcount that companies uh, add have historically been once they go IPO and go public. So if we don't get this engine going much faster, and you're going to tell me, but John, we're doing 250 IPOs this year, and I'm going to say, but David, it was 400 to 700 during the 90s, and the population's bigger. We need a whole different engine. Well, also, I was going to mention we had Michael Kratzios from the White House on stage yesterday mm -hmm. who said things that were very related to what you're saying, but mm -hmm. I think the audience response was more, it's not enough, and it doesn't factor in a lot of other key elements, particularly immigration policy that's really affecting seriously some of the uh, startups that are that are doing fantastic things. I want to go to the audience before, okay. because there's so many... Can I make one comment on immigration, then yeah, go please, to the audience? Please. Okay. Uh, you know, it's fascinating. All of you know the numbers. 40% uh, of the Fortune 500 were started by immigrants or the children of immigrants. Uh, if you look at the startups today, it, it probably out of the, the successful ones, that number is probably over 60%. And out of the 16 that I'm very close to and another 40 that I'm coaching, uh, I would say uh, in excess of 70% are first or second generation to our country. So as we bring in talented, which by the way, both the Democrats and Republicans agree with, they're just holding us hostage to the total immigration program. As you bring in talent like that, you're gonna have a lot more startups going, which means a lot more jobs uh, for new Americans and a lot more jobs for uh, uh, the immigration that I think makes our country great. If you do it. I mean, at the moment, that's a little bit sort of gridlocked, it seems. It sure uh, is. And anyway, uh, I do want to get to the audience because okay. I know they have great questions and comments for you. Uh, can we get okay. some a little bit of light? Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Are the mics ready to go? Okay. Who's got it? Okay. We're good. Right over here, get a mic to this person and the person next to them next. Okay. Okay. So we're at uh -oh. Michael. Okay. Now, lesson learned, we talked about it last year. If your first question comes from the back, that's usually somebody that came in a little bit late, liable to ask a tough question, going to dart out after the question. You go back, you put your arm Michael, around, and you wear them down. Last year too. But this is what you did last year. Yeah, anyway, I know, and I've got a firm hold on your neck. <laughs> so it's hard to ask as tough a question. So that's one of the lessons learned, and I always teach. Everything I do is about I'm going to come, too. Okay. All right. Okay, so David on, and I are David. putting the pressure on you. Go okay, ahead. Then. So uh, uh, the number of, of startups and new small businesses in this country dropped significantly about a dozen years ago. Yes. And has stayed down. Yes. Why do you think that happened, and do you see that changing? Yes, yeah, so uh, the numbers are right. It started to decline dramatically about a dozen years ago. We hit a 20-year low about two and a half years ago. We're excited that the IPOs have gone from 170 to, to maybe 240 this year. Uh, why did it happen? Uh, I think we no longer had a policy on it. We made difficult, so difficult for startups to do business. We teased before about it was like cooking you know, frogs in a pot. You turn up the temperature so slowly, you roast them, and you cook them, they don't jump out. And that's what we're doing to small business in this country. The regulatory issue is a disaster. Uh, we don't have policies in place to do it. Our education system is broken in K through 12. We should be teaching entrepreneurism in the third, fourth, and fifth grade. And we should be teaching concepts of AI in a fun way to learn, not just for the, quote, the geeky guys over to the side, because that's when we lose our women and a lot of our diversity. And so we need to make this a national policy. When this country does something, we can put a person on the moon. Yet there has not been the appetite to change this. And we're going to create a digital divide. If you would have seen my home state and what it was like walking down the roads this weekend, tremendous pride, and they just want people that will help us be successful. Nobody wants a handout. 
But if you look at the offices that are shut down, you look at the young people leaving the state, that's what's happening. We're hollowing out of America. And so we got to get this thing going again. And the answer is very simple. With national policy, we need to train entrepreneurism in school. We need to make uh, technology really fun to learn, uh, regardless of gender uh, or diversity issues. That sounds clear, but not simple, if you ask me. No, but it's, it's a fun thing. It's not real complex. We make it too complex. Why do we do 180 acquisitions better than anybody else? And Safra Katz still teaches you know, in the, the Cisco study at Stanford on how do we do it. Same vision and strategy, only acquire people that have a similar culture. It's got to align. You've got to be able to keep the people, get the next generation product out. Uh, you've got to be able to uh, really bring the geographic center city to it. Same thing for startups. It basically have the same check and balance in terms of what you need to do. So we do need a complex program, but you need to make it relatively simple to understand and then empower people to do it. Pass the mic next door. If France can do it, give me a break. <laughs> I mean, if France can do it, we're sitting here going, I can understand Israel. We all love Israel. They're the startup nation. India, you can say, well, you know, they're just engineers by background, 1.3 billion people <laughs> and 600,000 engineers a year. But France, now what I'm saying to us is America needs to get its act together. Okay, great. Do you agree? Yourself. Um, hi, um, hi, I'm Olivia. I'm a, a journalist at the Telegraph newspaper. Yes. Um, I just we, we've talked a lot about um, ethics and Silicon Valley. You yes. know, engaging more with ethical issues and worrying about its ethical position. Do you get the sense that new startups that you're working with now are kind of thinking harder about those ethical questions, be it kind of addiction or the impact they're having on society, than they might have done sort of 10, 15 years ago? Oh, great question. So. Um, the fun thing about no longer being associated with a company other than my own, I can say whatever I want and not <laughs> worry about the implications. I think there is a huge tug of war going on in Silicon Valley. Is tech for good or tech for bad? And I know you all discussed it last night. And I don't think it's predetermined which way it's going to go. Uh, if you watch during the 90s and the first decade of 2000, uh, we worked with government very effectively. Uh, with the internet, it had the same exposures that social media has today, and yet we were able to work through the issues. And there was a deep inbred given understanding that we owed an obligation to give back. Cisco trained seven million students on network academies. We won every corporate social reward there was to win. We got along with the Democrats and Republican. Nancy Pelosi is a very good friend. Kevin McCarthy is a very good friend. I think we have to go back to the basics. Are we really going to change the world in a very positive way? And if so, we have to walk the talk and it has to be into the culture. For my startups, the fun thing is it's like acquisitions. I only look at startups that have a chance to be number one or number two in their industry. They're right in front of an inflection point with a world-class wicked CEO that she or he wants to lead in. But then I look to culture. Do they really want to have a good culture? a culture of diversity. I'm challenging all my startups to interview at least one woman for every open position. It's amazing once you do that, you change the numbers by 10% within a decade. I'm sorry, within a year. And our numbers have been stuck, as you all know, for what, 10 years at about 25% in tech. So I think it's a tug of war. I only select startups who the CEO wants to build a strong culture. And most startups don't think about culture very long. In fact, many of them don't even write it down. But culture, to me, is as important as vision and strategy. So yes, I do on the startups. Yes, I believe it's a tug of war. And I think the outcome is still not known. When you travel in the mid, mid part of this country or the southeast, they don't view Silicon Valley in the way they did 10 years ago at all. We're, we're viewed as much negative uh, uh, more than positive. Wow. May I have that? Thank you. OK, who else has the nerve to ask one? OK, Brooks. <laughs> Gotcha. Brooks has nerve. Now, the front row is a lot I, more safe. I happen to know she uh, has This way, we've got you kind of cornered, et cetera. All right, go ahead. <laughs> no pressure. Great meeting you. Uh, so Identify I, yourself, please. I'm Brooks Bell. I, I run an experimentation consultancy that I started 15 years ago. Okay. So as an entrepreneur, what I'm jealous of all the startups who get to work with you. What is the one piece of advice that you find yourself consistently giving to your, your startup CEOs? Well, the first piece is the classic one because you've got to pull them close to you and show that you add value and how you do it. So your job as a CEO is vision and strategy for your company. Uh, it is to develop, recruit, retain, and change the leadership team, and unfortunately including probably one or two founders during the first couple of years. 
Uh, it is then culture, which most of them don't get back to the, the great question in the back there. Culture, you never have a great company without a great culture. You may like the culture at a Cisco or an Oracle or a Microsoft or a Walmart or not, but you always have strong cultures when you have it. And then communications, as you all know today, is so much more important with social media. You miss a social media move like United Airlines did by five minutes, and it's a billion dollars damage to you. So how do you listen in an entirely different way? Then the advice I give them is be bold and take more risks than you think. Just don't make the same mistakes twice. You've got to know what you know and know what you don't because so many of the startups are wicked smart people, often with an engineering background. And how do you think they do when they recruit a head of sales? Disaster. They try to recruit a business development person who thinks like an engineer, and that's not what a sales lead is. So know what you know, know what you don't, and either get advisors around you to help you through that, et cetera. And then have the courage to ask for people to give advice. And it's amazing. I had a lot of advisors over the years, some very famous, uh, you know, from the Henry Kissingers to the Shimon Perez to Bill Clinton, George Bush, et cetera, Thomas Friedman out of the New York Times, David, I'll, I'll call him up regularly and ask. But also a lot of your advisors are really technical people that kind of give you the background. So I develop advisors as well. So culture Is culture just about core values? Or no, what are the core thing drivers of culture? Core values, diversity. What yeah, I, I think part of it is core values, but I also start with a mission statement and what you're trying to accomplish. And it's amazing how many companies start to make moves as a startup or big companies, and they don't even understand their end game. You define your end game before you make your first move. You write the press release for what you want to look like three and five and seven years out. You then say, what is your mission? At Cisco, our mission wasn't to build routers and sell them to the internet. Our mission was to change the way the world works, lives, learns, and plays. Everybody said, John, that's nice marketing, but not true. I disagree. And so have, have a, a mission statement that really challenges you. Then what are the key values in it? Are you truly customer-driven or not? Don't kid yourself if you are or not. Do you treat your employees like family, or are they assets to you? You move around just like financial issues. Uh, do you really make innovation happen? And one of the key things that companies get in trouble on, just do the right thing. Write it down and practice it. But you as the CEO, most important, you've got to walk the talk. Because people very quickly see, do you walk the talk or not? Have the courage to make mistakes. I made a lot of them, and this will shock you. I wish I'd dreamed bigger, and I wish I'd made more mistakes, and I will in these startups. Thank you, John. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if Strat's here. Um, unfortunately, we probably don't have time for more questions, but if Strat's here. Well, John is literally the only big company CEO who used to come to Fortune when I was there. That, You know, we'd sit and listen to him for like half an hour, and then he'd say, no, no. What do you think we should do? Yeah. He would say that to us. It's like, wow, we, we, we're just journalists. You there. should have seen it yeah. when I asked it of the French press. <laughs> <laughs> Macron was on stage with me. He was economic minister at that time. And we were trying to explain why we thought France could become the innovation engine for Europe and the startup capital of Europe. And the questions were really tough. There were about 400 in the audience. And finally, I, I, I said, Emmanuel, let me ask a question of the French press. And he looked at me. And I said, how many of you believe that France can do this. And I would have been ecstatic if 10% of the room raised their hand. You know what happened? 80% of the room raised their hand. And Macron nation, was surprised. Well, I was surprised. Yeah. Both of us were. But the nation was ready to change, and the media got it, and they were going to play a key role. So wow. you, you learn more when you ask questions and you listen, David. Well, John, your style is pretty effective. Uh, and I want to make this an annual thing. Can we, like, try to do this again next year? I'd be honored. I would, David. Okay, John, thank you. thank you so He's much. He's getting pretty good at sales. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much.